for you to go just yet. It's been a long time. Snake. Zach, you're yep. good. So this is pretty much just the Metal Gear Solid cast before we do the um, the uh, the spoiler cast, which I think is pretty cool. Um, I'm gonna try to beat it before we pretty soon, so we can do that. But uh, Eric, Zach, we're recording. We're, seeing, we're we're just starting it live like this. I hope you guys are cool with that. Yeah. What's up? So. Uh, I'm Paul, editor in chief at Bit Cultures, and uh, I guess you're kind of gonna be kind of a co-host, at least in the meantime. Zach. All right. And just remind everyone, what do you do at Bit? Cultures? Yeah, I'm Zach, and I'm the guy who writes too much, uh, or so I'm told. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I just you wrote <laughs> you wrote four articles in one week. Yeah. You're supposed to do just one. I know, but. I do what I can handle. As long as you're not, you know, burning yourself out and killing yourself, <laughs> go for it. And then we also have, I guess we have a special guest. This is the the man who created this whole thing, the man responsible for us even talking to you in the first place. I guess you're the big boss of big mm -hmm. cultures. Uh, who, who do we have? Uh, hey, this is uh, Eric. I'm the, I guess, the founder, owner of Big Cultures, and uh, here's a guest this week. Big Boss is your title. Yeah, Big Boss. <laughs> uh, so we we skipped the show last week because uh, some stuff happened. Uh, we were busy. I was tired. We did a lot of work. So we didn't really uh, have the time to do a cast, but we're doing one now. Also, Sierra, who is our main co-host, along with me, she also couldn't make it this time, but she'll be here next week. Um, normally, we would be talking about the top 10 from last week, but since we didn't do a top 10 on the week before last, we're kind of, we're going to do that one. And the top 10 I'm talking about is the top 10 Metal Gear Solid boss fights. And the reason I wanted to do the one, uh, that one specifically today is because I have Eric and I have Zach, and all three of us wrote for this top 10. Uh, mm -hmm. This is one that we were really passionate about. Uh, we love Metal Gear Solid, and I think we came up with a really cool list. So, who who should start with the top with the number ten? Who? I guess I'll take ten since uh, I wrote that one. And uh, what's number ten? Uh, ten would be Big Boss from Metal Gear Two, Solid Snake. Mm -hmm. And uh, the reason we put him on the list not because the NES was famous for its very intricate boss fights, but is because he's so central to the plot of the series. Uh, his death here, or being defeated by Snake, uh, his body being requested in Metal Gear Solid, um, and spoilers for later in the series, uh, his body in Metal Gear Solid 4 is the key to the Patriot system. Uh, his biorhythm DNA is uh, important to running the Patriot's program. And that all starts with... Uh, him losing to Solid Snake in this boss fight. I had like I had no idea about any of that. Like I know Metal Gear Solid pretty well, but that I I started with Metal Gear Solid on the PlayStation. So anything that happened before then, I had no idea. So like even this fight with uh, Big Boss was just still pretty like pretty freaking new to me. And I was Zach, did you play the original like Metal Gear on the NES? No, I also started with Metal Gear Solid, but um you know, I guess probably a couple months before the Phantom Pain came out, I kinda sat down and did like some extensive research on the entire plot so that I made sure I knew what was going on. So I learned more about Outer Heaven and Zanzibar Land and things like that. So I at least had an idea. 
yeah, I had I had never played it up until that point. So I didn't even know who Big Boss was. So like any kind of twist that they would mention his name in Metal Gear Solid to me, that was just I have no idea who that is. But it sounded cool, and I I kind of really one point that we made it to include this fight in the top ten is because this is kind of the only old old school fight for many of the games in in the series. So I I wanted to make sure that we didn't just put only Metal Gear Solid fights, which I mean, it's easy to just include every single fight from the original Metal Gear Solid on the PlayStation because mm-hmm. almost every fight in that game was incredible. That's true. And then, you know, the fights from Metal Gear Solid 3. I wanted to make sure we included some of the oldies and then some of the new ones. So I'm glad we got that one in. So I'm having some trouble getting to number nine. So until then, Eric, what's number nine? Number nine is the fight with Liquid Ocelot in Metal Gear Solid 4, Guns of the Patriots. Who um, wrote that one? I wrote that one as well. We we should probably just state that all of these are spoilers for the series. So anyone who <laughs> is behind should not listen to this part uh, of the podcast. Yeah, yeah. Skip to the next part. Uh, That's good. So Metal Gear Solid Four Guns the Patriots. At the end of the game, uh, you've based you've stopped Liquid's plan to take over the world with the Outer Haven uh, battleship and. He takes Snake to the top of the ship, and uh, the game turns to Tekken. The two of them <laughs> he turns to the Tekken. Uh, the two of them go through a, a CQC fight, which is pretty cool. It was something that doesn't show up anywhere in the series, where it's a very like, uh, very personal, very fighter, fighting game controlled kind of fight. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, you go through this fight, and as you're beating. Ocelot's or Liquid Ocelot's uh, life bar down. He starts going through his uh, psyche levels. So it starts with, uh, I believe, it starts with the Metal Gear Solid soundtrack, and it's the Liquid song, uh, or the song that plays when you fight Liquid on top of Rex, I believe. Mm-hmm. And then you beat him, and it switches to the Metal Gear Two theme, where uh, Ocelot is. Uh, stealing the ray and then when you beat him to the third part it goes to ocelot from to the song snake eater which uh, that's one of my favorite songs in the series so like when you get to that point and uh he starts acting like his younger self uh that was great and then it ends with the uh the four theme and just the whole fight is very fern- fan service but i mean i'm a fan of the series so i loved it so it was very uh very cool I was uh, I was rewatching this fight, and I, I did love it when I first played it. But rewatching it, it was a little, just a little tiny bit cheesy. Uh, there's one part in particular where I, I'm not sure what it was that uh, I think it was Snake. He kept having to inject himself with something. I, I don't remember if it was to stay alive or it was to the uh, the needle with. I don't know, that needle was like a magic potion in that game. Right, the magic it would, potion. It would just basically give them energy or it would stop dr- disease from killing someone it, Did, or it kills vampires. It, it did <laughs> I, didn't it like, it like basically because the nano machines or whatever were causing the aging process and I think it like slowed it down or something like that. Like he said, giving them energy to keep going because Snake yeah. regularly takes it throughout like the course of that game. Yeah, but then uh, Liquid Ocelot starts taking it, I think, right? right. Because at, at they, one point in the fight, <laughs> yeah, that's the part that I love <laughs> because they're like, they're like, we're gonna kill each other, but like, we we I love you and you love me, so like, I it's like I inject you and then you inject <laughs> me just to keep the fight fair and, uh, and and passionate between us to make sure that we're equally uh, strong. Well, I think it had to end but, that way. I mean. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was pretty cool, I guess. It was really cool that they kind of did that, even though it was just extremely over dramatic. But that's that's what Metal Gear is, anyway. Uh, who? Okay, I found the page. Now that I'm good, I'm good, Eric. I'm good. Oh, uh, number eight, you're gonna like uh, Metal Gear Ray fight from Metal Gear Rising Revengeance. Eric, you have a lot to say about this one because yeah, you this... you're the reason this is even in here. <laughs> I'm going to talk about this one, and then I'm going to let someone else talk. So, uh, this one I fought in 
you guys didn't believe me that this fight was cool. Mm -hmm. This this is the one fight in the entire series where I actually I felt the uh, power of a cyborg ninja. <laughs> so <laughs> this is what Kojima I felt pictured a ninja could do in the series. Mm -hmm. um, the way that you use Raiden. This is the first. This is in the first ten minutes of the game. I fought this the other day because I was bored. I just threw in the game and it was ready because it was in the beginning. You fight this Ray, who a Metal Gear in the series has been always this final boss esque like thing that you're always preparing to fight. And Raiden just destroys this thing. He he cuts it to pieces. Uh, he picks it up. He's deflecting bullets and cutting rockets in half. Mm -hmm. um, this fight, also with the heavy metal soundtrack behind it, just it was just cool. It's just a bunch of cool in a fight, and uh, you get to destroy a Metal Gear piece by piece, which I thought was great. Yeah, I, I had no idea about this fight. I haven't played Revengeance, and then when you brought it up, I figured you, just, you thought it was a cool robot fight, but is does it really deserve a spot on the top 10, you know, greatest fights in the history of Metal Gear Solid? And I had to watch it myself. And then when I did finally watch it, I thought this this could be number one. Now, this is like the, the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life. And I, I was happy that you brought it up. This is why I wanted a lot of people to kind of bring in all their ideas. Because if it wasn't for you, a, a lot of Metal Gear Solid Revengeance fans would be really pissed right now that we didn't put them in the top 10. So. Yeah. Zach, I don't think you played it either. Did no, you? I didn't play it. Uh, I think at the most I played of it was like a demo when it came out. Um, but, I, I mean, it is, I do really like the idea that like Raiden, you know, gets to be a badass because, I mean, think about how he was received when Sons of Liberty came out and everyone mm -hmm. is like, who is this loser, basically? Like, he's not Solid Snake, but then you know, we don't we don't see him really like become realized until you know we get we get you know the, the scenes in Metal Gear Solid Four, obviously. But then now this is actually putting it in the players' hands. So I definitely see why what Eric's saying about how you know like this is like realizing what Kojima like thought Raiden's character could be. So it's it is really cool. Yeah, Eric, you, you, I, I'm I'm glad you brought this up. It, it wouldn't have been here otherwise. So you, good job. I'm I'm glad you did it. So this is for you. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> I can't, I can't stop it once it starts playing, so they'll be over soon. Okay, number six, number six. Oh, no, wait, no, no, no. Number seven, my bad. Number seven is the Middle Gear Rex fight from the original Middle Gear Solid, and I wrote this. And this is one I think we all, we all know why it's on here. Uh, I, what I wrote is that it is. So many things happen in this fight. It is. First of all, it's the culmination of like you getting to Metal Gear, right? You're trying to stop Metal Gear Solid. Well, first you're first you're trying to find out what if it if it's even if it can launch anything, right? If they can use it as a as an attack, and then once you find it, then you have to destroy it. So this is you finally going, you know, face to face with a giant, cool ass T Rex looking robot, and not only that, but Liquid Snake is piloting it, right? So Liquid Snake, uh, Solid Snake's brother, twin, he's there too. So that alone is cool enough for this to be in the top 10. That already makes the fight incredible and memorable. And then uh, the ninja shows up, uh, Frank Yeager. Keep forgetting his name, but then Frank Yeager shows up, and then he turns the fight into like an anime cutscene, right? Where he starts like flipping through the walls and... Uh, Trying to get to the T Rex, but then, yeah. Spoiler alert, uh, Zach. What you you remember? What happens to Frank in this fight? Uh, he gets uh, mortally wounded. Uh, okay. and obviously, eventually dies. And you know, one of the most emotional moments in the series when he's talking to Snake about uh, yeah. you know about utilizing the only thing that he was good at, which was fighting. You know, for a, a good cause and being able to mm -hmm. die that way. So it was it was pretty touching and really gave that scene that extra oomph to push you, which really yeah, makes a, any boss fight good when they can pull that off. It was it was really touching. Is it? I think it was him saying, uh, we're not tools of the government or anyone else. Something along those lines. And it's just, it was 
the ninja, the ninja itself, uh, Gray Fox, and that game was my favorite character in in the first Metal Gear Solid. Uh, everything about him was awesome and then just memorable. And the fact that they they kill him off, spoilers, and that's it. I mean, I, I kept hoping with game after game that they was like they would somehow bring him back because he was just always my favorite. But at least this was a really cool way for him to go uh, after you know everything that had happened at the beginning. But I I definitely think it deserves to be up this high in the top five. But then. There is another fight that I think we kind of, we couldn't figure out if this should be number six or number five, but then, uh, I'm sorry, number six or number seven. And then number six, Zach. Yes, it is. You wrote yes, number six. Yes, I did. And it is that epic fight with the hind D that you see take off at the very beginning of Metal Gear Solid. And it's it's another boss fight that really gets a lot of its significance from the story that is the exposition that's revealed around the time that it happens, you know, you know, solid snake really, you know, he's really just kind of following orders up until this point. And he kind of has this confrontation with liquid where liquid basically tells him whether he's able to make sense of it or not, that, that, that they're brothers and that, you know, they, he tells him, you know, he, that he killed their father. So you kind of can start to piece it together. Like you said, it's a little confusing for us who started with Metal Gear Solid and, you know, don't really know who Big Boss was. And we're kind of learning about the Les Enfanteries project, you know, as we go through this game. But, you know, it's, it, it's like that's the first big knowledge drop right there where, you know, you realize like the nature of Solid and Liquid and their connection. I like that you properly pronounce that too. A lot of people don't go really make the effort to actually pronounce that with the French accent. Les I just call it. A, if I if I ever have to talk about it, I just call it the the terrible infants because I'm not gonna try to pronounce <laughs> it like you're supposed to. Is that was this the first time you see uh, like a liquid snake? Um. Well, you. I mean, you see him get into the chopper, into the hind at the beginning. I think. But I mean, like actually talk and. In, in Iraq, well, uh, he, Eric and I were just discussing this the other day as I was asking about the character McDonald Miller because Liquid actually impersonates McDonald Miller on a radio right. frequency. So, I mean, they are talking through that portion of the game, but he obviously doesn't know that it's Liquid. Spoilers. In... Well, we've already said it's a little too late now. <laughs> <laughs> I know, this is like spoilers in the game. That was actually a pretty cool twist. I, I didn't see it coming in the game. I'm pretty sure nobody did in the game because it's not like anyone could think that it could be someone else. Well, Master Miller never had a voice in the older one, so it's not like anyone knew he wasn't British or anything like that. So, right. right. Wait, why is uh, why does Liquid Snake have a why does he have a British voice? Uh, he grows up in the uh, UK, oh, so okay. that's why he uh, or in UK or. Uh, some British co- colony, but he 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 grew up away from uh, uh, Solid. See, that's that's why you're here. Or that's why we couldn't do this without you. Thank you. Guys. This is like, I wish I could just stop this. <laughs> Number five, uh, Gray Fox slash Ninja Frank Yeager. I wrote this one again because it's this is the Ninja again and. Uh, yeah, I think we all, if we played Metal Gear Solid 1, uh, one of the things that stood out is when we first saw um, the ninja just pop out of nowhere and cut uh, Revolver Ocelot's hands. Except, no, I think it's just one hand. He cuts his hand. I think that's the first time you see the ninja, right? Uh, and yeah. it is... That's when the game goes from being, you know... Okay, there are some soldiers and there are some cool people here with, you know, there's Revolver Ocelot who has cool tricks up his sleeve. But then, now there's like a, a robotic cyborg ninja in the game. And this is kind of like the beginning of everything else that's going to happen in the game. All the crazy shit that you're going to see, like with, you know, psychic... Uh, well, we'll get, to, we'll get to that at the end. But the ninja fight, once you do get to fight him... Um, and this is something that I remember loving because there is so much history in them two just talking 
that it made me want to know, like, what exactly are they talking about? Because he talks about a lot of the things that happen in the old NES games, right? Or at least the lore in between those games. So, correct me if I'm wrong, because I probably will be wrong about a couple of things, but Frank Yeager, he used to be Snake's, Solid Snake's, um, his his friend, his best friend, but he they were, I guess, comrades in battle. Like, they worked together, they kind of grew up together. Frank Yeager was a little older than Snake, right? And then, I think something happened where, again, correct me if I'm wrong, Eric, and Stack, um, but... About his sister, you already talked. So. I, I, that, yeah, I, 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 I think I recall uh, reading that, um, and thinking Metal Gear... T- we're thinking Metal Gear 2 that Solid Snake, one of his objectives was to rescue Frank. Right. And, um, but then I was, I was thinking earlier too, you know, in Metal Gear Solid, they elaborate the whole reason he's in the cyborg suit was because Solid and Frank fought hand to hand on a minefield. But I think, um, I think from what I remember, so Solid Snake's mission in Metal Gear 2, right, was to rescue Frank Yeager. But then once he got there, Frank was already brainwashed, right? He was already gone to the other side. Or am I wrong about that? Uh, I think he chose to be with Big Boss because Frank's actually a, a lot older. He's from uh, his past. Uh, he shows up, I think, in Portable Ops as a different character. I um, mean, no, I think that's Frank. Um, so he's he's been around a while. He's much older in the, mm-hmm. the later games, but... Yeah. Uh, uh, he I do chose to be with Big Boss, I believe. That's why they fought. See, this is why I want the original games re- remade today. Because there's a lot of things that happen in those games that I want to see. Uh, it, it, you know, with actual cutscenes and more like dialogue added to them. Because we're, we're going to talk about Metal Gear 5 in a little bit, but... There is so much that happens in between Metal Gear Solid 5 and then this Metal Gear Solid, right? Where you have Solid Snake, you know, becoming a soldier, becoming a legend himself, you know, trying to rescue Frank Yeager and then having to fight Yeager and then having to fight Big Boss and then having to supposedly, you know, kill Big Boss and then Solid Snake has to retire and then, you know, years go by and then Metal Gear Solid. Like, there is so much in there. That I'm not sure if we're ever gonna see it, you know, in, you know, in HD and like, you know, with the graphics that we have now. But am I the only one who wants to see that, at least like part of that again? Because I don't think we've gotten to see it properly or as we should. Well, it would be cool, but unfortunately, Kojima can no longer do anything with the Metal Gear franchise, so. Yeah, <laughs> he's gone, and the way it looks, Konami's not gonna make any more. Uh, platform games it uh, seems i am i'm not gonna lose hope i am gonna I'm, I'm hoping that it will happen one day but they but we'll see sell the title but i don't i don't know what konami's doing but if konami makes those games without kojima i i don't think they're gonna do that because the whole company is just going like somewhere else and so i i really hope that they wouldn't do that because it just it wouldn't be right There'll be a Pachinko remake of uh, Metal Gear 2. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that's the Gray Fox fight. And then there's more that happens in that fight. You know, they talk about their history. And then Gray Fox, he just wants to fight Snake to kind of relive uh, past memories of being on the battlefield. He wants to feel alive again, like he says. Wait, actually, I almost forgot. I have a clip. No, I do not. <laughs> I forgot that was the uh, the other fight that I wanted to play for you. Uh, the clip that I had, uh, Zach, yeah. uh, is from the High D fight. So I have it here. I forgot to play it then, so I might as well play it now. There it is. Uh. So yeah, you can't see that, but his snake is wearing the tuxedo, which I forgot what happens when you unlock the tuxedo in Metal Gear Solid. I think is it the infinite ammo or was that's that the, the bandana. bandana? What does the tuxedo do? I'm not sure. It's anything more than cosmetic or 
cosmetic. Uh, it's not even know if that's the right word. I'm losing it. <laughs> Aesthetic. <laughs> but yeah, that was the uh, the Gray Fox fight. It's I I, I I love that. I don't think. See, there's the uh, the the remake on the GameCube, and I don't think it was as good as the original on the on the PlayStation. There was. The the interactions between uh, Snake and uh, Gray Fox was just not as good. I don't think the dialogue was just perfect in the first. Wait, they, and I I I would have preferred if it was just kept the dialogue as it was. I didn't even know that they changed it. I never played that version. That's ridiculous. Yeah, like they re-recorded everything in the game. Oh. Mm-hmm. Well then. And not only that, they also kind of uh, went a little overboard with the uh, cinematics. Ah. Where, uh, if you remember, like, if you just remember uh, Gray Fox coming, jump, kind of jumping out of nowhere and cutting Revolver Ocelot's hand, mm-hmm. you know, that's that's enough, you think, for a game. But then in the remake, he does, like, ten flips, and then he does, like, ten more backflips before he finally cuts uh, Ocelot's hand. I'm, I'm, I think I'm remembering a little... A little I see. Differently, but I mean, it's a, they go way too like way too far with the cinematics, and that's something that I hated about the the remake. Mm. Gotcha. I know that you, Eric, you played the remake before. Um, yeah, I, I played um, the remake. Um, I mean, I I liked it because I had come fresh out of Metal Gear Solid Two because it had this it had a similar control scheme, but it it definitely was too easy on the GameCube mm-hmm. uh, because it was this. The level design was the same exact as the PS1, mm-hmm. but you were given first-person shooting, which kind of made the fights way too easy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was still a cool remake. <laughs> now, number four, I... Zach, you wrote number four, actually, The Sorrow, mm-hmm. and uh, I forgot that you wrote it for a reason that we're going to go into, <laughs> but... <laughs> me, t- me too, but, um, yeah, it's The, the Sorrow... Uh, I did see when I was writing this. I remember this is uh, this this is shows an, another side to Kojima's games that I didn't remember until I started playing the Phantom Pain, which is me getting frustrated to no end because while well, this this fight's really cool because I mean uh, just to walk people through it, you know, it, it they you walk you're walking down like a stream following trying to chase after the sorrow and there are actually these like uh phantoms like these soldiers come up that are that are reflective upon how many people you take out during the game up to that point and um i just remembered probably doing this fight at least 30 times before i even started to like try to think about like what the hell i was doing wrong because you just keep dying over and over and over again and it has one of those kojima twists where it's like you know a common theme throughout the whole series is that that, you know things aren't necessarily what they seem and you got to think outside the box and if eventually it dawns on you to like try different things like you know going into your item menu and realizing you have a revival pill and you can revive yourself from a game over screen which is kind of absurd but <laughs> what else do you expect from a metal gear game i guess you should know better at that point so uh, <laughs> like why does that make sense was snake was, i mean was big boss dead or is he dying um, or was well, what was happening for that to make sense? I don't remember where he how he ended up in that scenario. Do you remember that? See, it's been such a long time since I played it. Um, you know, uh, I, I just rem- I just can I can vi- I can visualize the boss fight where with, with uh, the sorrow kind of floating, always mm-hmm. out of your reach, and you're wading through this water, and you got these guys attacking you, and you know, I didn't I didn't even realize I realized until you know much later that uh. Like I said, the the amount of like your, the obstacle in your way, the other soldiers coming after you, is reflective upon how many lives you've taken, which is really kind of a neat uh, addition into it. So, like, I I wonder what that fight looks like when you, if you can tr- try to play like a true stealth game, if that's even possible. I don't think you can <laughs> do anything differently. I mean, you you still have to go through the same thing. Yeah. I think the only thing that'll change if you if you don't kill anyone. Except the uh, you know the Cobra members, which you have to right. kill. Uh, if you don't kill anyone, then it's just you walking through water with nothing happening. Except you'll see the the, the pain <laughs> and like randomly walk by mm-hmm. you, and that's it. No, nobody else, and then you know one more enemy. But 
like I remember what happened. You should, you were just walking through the jungle. You were just walking through a, like you know there's a little bit of water by your feet, and then you run into the sorrow, and then the fight starts. And then once you you know you uh, take the pill or you know chew on the pill, then you wake up drowning like you almost died in the water. So I don't know what was happening in between that because they don't really explain it. They don't really go into detail. So I still don't really understand why. It's a cool concept, but it didn't really make sense to me that, like, it's not like a thing where it wasn't with, like, with a fight that we're going to talk about later, where it kind of made sense for you to unplug this and plug it here. And, you know, you know, when you actually have to think about it, I don't think anyone actually got this on the first try. I don't see how anyone would even think about this. I, the first I time. died and restarted a few times. And I, mm -hmm. whenever I found a, a new weapon, I made sure to test it. So I had a lot of corpses right. in my uh, lit river. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I don't, I don't think anyone would actually figure out that you had to do that thing with the pill on the first try. No, I don't, and I don't think it was intended. I think that Kojima yeah. likes to screw with people, and he gets a lot of pleasure yeah. out of it. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. I guess, but unlike other fights in the series, this one, it, it's awesome, but it, it's just kind of the the sense behind the solution to the fight. I think made a little less sense than you know, especially when we talk about number one later on. Mm -hmm. But it was still pretty cool. Uh, number three, the boss. Who wrote the boss? Zach, you wrote the boss. Of course I did. <laughs> this, uh, this is, I mean, I could, I could easily see this even being higher on the list. I think we, I think our reasoning for ultimately pushing it down the list was because, you know, the actual mechanics of the fight were rather simplistic. But mm -hmm. as far as story significance, especially with Phantom Pain just coming out, this, I feel like this boss fight is the most significant one in the series potentially yeah. just because yeah. it, it 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 is an experience that changes uh naked snake forever and for better mm -hmm. for worse sends him down the path that we we know him as you know as we've discussed up to this point and you know we see him you know as as a guy who was really you know faithful to his country and followed all his orders and become disenfranchised and realize that you know even you know, following orders maybe necessarily isn't, you know, the thing that's going to lead him down the path that he believes in. And, you know, the rest of his sto story arc becomes about trying to preserve his idea of the boss's vision. So, I mean, you know, that kind of says it all. And it's the fight itself is just so poetic as you fight her in this field of flowers. And, mm -hmm. and what happened at the end of the oh, fight? You're going to make me talk about that, yeah. Yeah, that yeah, point yeah, where you, uh, like, I think Eric said when we were discussing this, you, you, that you think it's a cutscene and you're just holding a gun to her head, <laughs> and you mm -hmm. just sit there and then realize that you have to pull the trigger, and you're kind of just like, yeah. what if I don't pull the trigger, and what, you don't have a choice? Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and mm -hmm. so you feel the you feel the weight the big boss felt, you know, taking out his mentor. And you kill the boss. <laughs> I don't know. Well, that just killed the mood. <laughs> Yeah, I don't. That, that was not what I was supposed to play, but we'll go with that. Um, the yeah, I remember. I think it's kind of funny that we have uh, number two, three, and four. We haven't talked about two yet, but I mean, if anyone's listening who has played Metal Gear Solid, will will should know what the next two you know will be. So I think it's kind of funny that two, three, and four are all uh, from the same game. Um. But the boss fight, I, I, when we started the list, I was expecting this to be number two. I didn't think this would get knocked to number three. I mean, but I mean, there's, there's good reasons for what we chose as number two. Uh, but yeah, especially with, you know, Metal Gear Solid 5 that just came out, I think it's really, it's, it, it kind of makes this, uh, fight and then the outcome a little more, uh, you know, more uh, special, I guess, not more momentous when you go back and think about it or replay it if you get a chance. Because I, that is kind of the beginning of, uh, you know, Naked Snake becoming Big Boss. And then to the Big Boss that we're, you know, playing as now in Metal Gear Solid 5. So, 
Eric, do you have anything to say about the boss? Um, it was just a, it, it's a moment in the gaming, like, series for into all of Metal Gear that, like, I just really attached to, because, I mean, 3 was a great game, but this boss fight in that game, at least to me personally, was, was my favorite. Just, the, <laughs> the way it's presented, uh, it's got all that Kojima, uh, cinematography in it, and... The way it's, it forces you to make choices you don't want to do, even though this is your enemy. So yeah, I mean everything that Zach talked about and more. Like, I loved about that fight. Right fight. All right, number two is the end. Also from Metal Gear Solid Three Snake Eater. This was written by our, our, our guest writer, uh, Mel, and uh, she she wanted this to be number one. And I think she was a little bit uh, outnumbered with this being number one and not one ended up being number one. But I could see why she just would want this as number one. I mean, I mean, if you played Metal Gear Solid 3, if you know anything about it, do you know all the crazy things that can happen with this fight? Uh, well, I mean, before we, we talk about that, let's talk about who the end is. He's, I guess he was the greatest sniper of, of all time. Um, it was, there's been a lot of sniping, uh, battles in Metal Gear Solid games, but I think this is easily the best. I mean, Sniper Wolf was cool, but this was just something else completely. Now, the end is what, like a hundred years old? He, yeah, he's, he's very old already in the sixties. Hmm. And he doesn't, from what I remember, he doesn't do anything. Like, he's just sitting down or sleeping. And the reasoning for that was that he's just waiting for the moment, I guess, like for him to have a final fight. Um, so he's just kind of been saving his energy for a long time. And he has a parrot on his shoulder at all times. And um, there's something that happens with him where he like when he's looking through his sniper, like, you know, through the uh, the little uh, eye hole, like his his eye starts kind of wobbling and get huge. Like, I don't I don't know what was up with that. Uh, I don't think it's... anyone... It's, uh, his eyes can look in different directions, so That's one eye is on the crazy. scope, and one eye is for spotting, which is why he doesn't need a spotter. That is crazy, that is insane. Oh my god, I bet Kojima's just like, he, he just had a, like, a dream about that, and then he just woke up in the middle of the night and wrote it down. <laughs> but, and then, uh, and then something happens once you finally kill him, but we'll get to that, but, uh, there's like, like, three, four different ways you can, you can go about this fight, like, a, you can just go and, you know, have the sniper fight if you're boring and you just want to deal with that away. <laughs> like, if you can't think of anything else, uh, you can do what I did and just kind of run up to him and stab him a couple times and just keep chasing him down. And then there's other ways to kill him, and this is where the game gets uh, weird. Uh, and these are the reasons like, the, the fight got so, so high up at number two. Uh, one of the ways you can kill him, Eric, do you want to talk about this, like, the way you can, like, uh, wait, make the game wait? You can, uh, and people didn't find this out for a little while, but you can start the fight and uh, turn off the game, uh, go into the console itself and change the date to, I think the minimum was a week you had yeah. to turn it to, mm -hmm. and when you turn the game back on, he's dead. Or... He died of old age. <laughs> or you could actually wait a week... <laughs> Uh, and not play your, your game for a week, and then he'll die of old age that way. <laughs> uh, I don't think anyone actually did that. But, and then there's one more way. Uh, Zach, do you know what the, the other way is that you can kill him? Yeah, I, I have, I never actually did this myself, but from what I understand, mm -hmm. it's like whenever you first see him in the game when he's being pushed out in his wheelchair, you can take him mm -hmm. out then. And when you get to yeah. the boss area, he's just not there. You just walk through. Yeah, this <laughs> I think, like, out of all the boss fights in any game, I think this one had the most, like, thought put into it. I'm pretty sure. This is one that they had a lot of fun with. Like, what if you kill him this way? Or what if you kill him this way? What if you, you know, don't do anything and he dies that way? Uh, this is why this is, you know, so high up. And then, once you do kill him, when, when you kill him, something happens. Like, doesn't he kind of, like, uh, like, he becomes part of the forest or something crazy happens. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. 
I forgot like I forgot what was up with that, but uh, I have a clip from the boss, and hopefully it'll play this time. And I am uh, clicking play as I'm talking, and that is not the boss fight <laughs> here. Here, here it is. So, uh, yeah, that was an accident. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the end. I don't know. Like, I want to. It's like I want to talk about the end some more, but I don't know. There's nothing else for me to say. I just kind of want to repeat what we've already talked. It's, it's just such a cool, like, it's such a cool thing that can only happen in video games. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. this is not something that somebody watching a movie can like explain to their kids like i watched this movie and then like i like you know how the bad guy like the 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 villain at the end of the movie you know how he died like i went to sleep and then that's how the villain and the <laughs> guy like this and, like this is like these are the things that can only happen in video games and then and metal gear solid you know kojima they just love to just break the fourth wall and just mess with uh players sure uh so that uh now we get to number one number one uh, I'm gonna eventually get more of these sound clips for uh, like the rest of the entries, but we only have this for number one, which is SpongeBob saying number one. Oh my god! <laughs> uh, who wrote number one? Eric, you wrote, you wrote number one. Yeah, I wrote number one. Uh, so our number one pick was Psycho Manus from Metal Gear Solid. Mm-hmm. And the reason, I and mean, one of the reasons we picked his this fight is just because it. It was on the PS1, but it was so so out there, so revolutionary for a boss fight, mm -hmm. where it would... He starts the fight with you asking him to put your controller down, mm -hmm. and he moves it. Uh, he moves it through the, the rumble pack and the dual shock moving. No, but, no, he moves it through uh, well, for, telepathic through psychic, abilities. Psychic powers, yes. yes he, no, that's how he moves he the moves controller. He moves the controller, mm -hmm. but... It's just, he he does all these things to interact with the player itself, which breaks the fourth wall, which is what Kojima established himself as after this fight. Mm -hmm. uh, he also reads your memory card, and mm -hmm. if there's any game that uh, he saw on your memory card that he knew about, he would talk to you about it. And especially just... if, if it was made by Konami. <laughs> oh, if it was a Konami game, he, he would have a, a day with that. Mm -hmm. But, uh... The fight itself is, you know, pretty normal, and then uh, as you're going, the screen goes black, and mm -hmm. you only see Hideo. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is Psycho Manus controlling the screen, mm -hmm. and then uh, he starts moving Snake himself. So now you have no control of this character that you're supposed to be fighting with. I forgot about that part. So the way that you had to beat him... Uh, if you couldn't figure it out on your own, uh, Campbell will call you and tell you, but if you take your controller and switch to controller port 2, he can no longer control you because you're not in the same port. Uh, that was the secret to beating him, and it's just all these things combined to uh, one of the craziest boss fights anyone's seen at that time, and even mm -hmm. to now, like, there's very few to uh, compare to this. Yeah. I mean, Zag, like, the first time you played, like, the first time you fought this, like, was this not the craziest shit you've ever, like, experienced while playing a game? Because it was for me. Yeah, so up to that point in Metal Gear Solid, like, I, I get to imagine, like, I'm, like, probably not even 10 years old, like, when I'm playing this for the first time. And so, like, I'm still learning about games, and, you know, you have moments... In the earlier Metal Gear Solid, like I was just telling someone about about um when you have to the first time you had to find Meryl's codec number, 
and like I I ran around the game for like th- several hours looking for a number on a CD case in the game because mm-hmm. I didn't understand that you could literally mean the CD case like he was talking to me the player and so yeah so when you get to this fight it's just a continuation of that and and I I think for these kind of reasons that I wouldn't just call Psycho Mantis the number one Metal Gear fight I honestly think it's the best boss fight that's ever been made in any game mm. just because a lot of the things that Eric already mentioned that. It is not just a fight between Solid Snake and Psycho Mantis, but it is a mind game between you and this boss that's in the game. It is drawing, it is the most ingenious way to draw the player into it that forces you to sit there and think, you know, it, you know, it's so, it's, it's easy to just put you, put a gun in your hands and tell you to shoot at an enemy, but to have to sit there and th- really think about all your different options about how to beat this guy who can read your mind. And it, it just, it, it, you know, it it brings such a player element out into it like no other boss fight that I've ever seen in my life. And not to mention that Psycho Mantis is just like one of the most mysterious and awesome characters in all of Metal Gear. So, yeah, for anyone who wasn't around or, you know, was too young to play this when it first came out, uh, just imagine like 1998, right? And you're playing this game, um, you're like what, 10, 15 years old, you're playing this. So this, like, the reactions that Kojima wanted you to have, like, they actually, they happened to me. Like, I reacted the way that they intended to. So when he said, when the Psycho Mantis tells you, put the put the controller on the ground, I did. Like, okay, me? Like, you want me to put the controller? Because he's, like, talking directly to the camera at this point. He's like, oh, you want me to show you my powers? Okay, take your controller, your PlayStation controller, put it on the ground, and then you watch what I do. So then I did. Uh, and then, this, you know, it starts moving, starts shaking. Uh, and then when he, uh, kinda supposedly changes the channel on your TV to make it look like it changed your channel, I did like, I was actually dumbfounded and I was like, I thought, what, what just happened? Like, is my TV okay? And then, you know, and then it goes right back to the fight. So it wasn't like, it was the way that they, they broke the fourth wall in this fight, like, in, in like four or five different ways. Like, they actually, they, they made sense and they actually worked. It, it wasn't like a game trying to break the fourth wall and then you you knowing that they're doing it, right? It's not like Deadpool saying something funny to the player, but you know, like he's they're breaking the fourth wall on purpose. This like this fight, they did things to mess with your mind where you didn't really think that's what was happening. Like that's that's, and to me, that's a, a good example of why this is just such a, it's just a, and like a magnific- magnificent magnificent. Uh, a way to like develop this boss fight. It was just, I I really wish everyone could have played this at the time that it came out and experienced it um, when it came out because it's not something you just go back to and uh, and uh, get the same feeling out of. Because if you play that game now and then he tells you that he's gonna read your memory card, you're gonna be looking at your PlayStation Three and then you're gonna think, what's a memory card? Like I don't know what Psychomancer is talking about. So you're not gonna get the same kind of effect. But I let's let's listen to the fight real quick before we move on. So cool, so cool. The nostalgia. Yeah, I. God, the game's so good. Now we're moving on to the review. Uh, there's there were a couple of reviews <laughs> last week, but there's one that I wanted to talk about in particular. There was a pretty kind of a, a tiny game that came out. It's not like a huge game or anything, but uh, Eric, you reviewed a game. Uh, what what was that game that you reviewed? I reviewed uh, Metal Gear Solid Five. Oh, Final Metal Gear Five. That's yeah. that's the game. You gave it a ninety seven, right? Yes. I uh, and I made sure to do my duty as a fan of Metal Gear and finish it before reviewing. Uh, I thankfully 
I guess we'll say, uh, was home a lot that week and sick, so I was able to put 45 hours in for this review. And this game, to me, as a Metal, fan, Metal Gear fan, uh, is great. I know a lot of people are hating on the changes that Kojima took to the uh, the narrative presentation, where it was there's no linear transit, there's no linear story, there's no uh, two hour cutscenes in the middle of the game. Uh, you are free to do what you want as Big Boss, and I really liked it. The gameplay was. Some of the best I've ever felt in a game. Uh, it made me feel like I was a super soldier. And I got to control Mother Base and control Diamond Dogs. So I felt like I was actually a big boss. Do you think this is the best Metal Gear Solid game? It's not the best Metal Gear Solid game. Uh, at least in my eyes. I, I still think 3 and 4 are some of the best games I've ever played in my life. Mm -hmm. But this one's definitely the best. I'll put this as my pick for the best uh, game itself that Kojima's ever made. Um, because Kojima's always been a huge uh, believer of story. And mm -hmm. I always thought the gameplay, for the most part, in the other games was lacking. But this one was, my I would feel, is the best game he's ever made. Uh, I'm like, I'm like five, uh, I'm like seven hours in, and I, well, no, Zach, I want you to talk about it, because you've, you've finished it too, I don't want you to go into detail, because we're gonna have a spoiler cast on the whole game. Of course. But, sure. what, what, what score would you have given it, that's what I'm curious about. See, this is, I, I... I even messaged Eric whenever we were both playing the game still. Neither one of us had beaten it. And I said that I honestly, this I, I was so glad I wasn't reviewing this game. Because I to this point, I still don't know. Like, it's so hard for me to put a number on this game. Because I have such conflicted views about it. That being said, you know, looking when I read Eric's review, I, I agree with almost everything that he said. You know, I he's right that this... Gameplay wise, as a game, this is yeah, it absolutely is the best Metal Gear. It's not the best Metal Gear solid game, but it is the best game, like he said, that Kojima has made. Because, I mean, technically and gameplay wise, it is completely sound, 100%. I had like a couple issues very early in the game where I had some crashes, but other than that, like the game runs better than any game does on current generation consoles. Um, things like that but where my issue started to come in was um, exactly the kind of things that uh, he was just Eric was just mentioning that he liked but um, I, I believe you even mentioned at one point there was a lot of controversy around like Metal Gear Solid 4 and the fact that there was like hours and hours of cutscenes in that mm -hmm. game and it really took a lot of the player element out of it but for somebody who plays Metal Gear because I love the story and the lore so much and I'm so fascinated by it that I was I was left feeling very frustrated early in the game because especially early in the game, you know, that's just a lot of just like, you know, doing tasks to help start building diamond dogs basically. And, you know, I felt like I though I didn't really have like a lot of reason other than that behind what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And so it was it was a little frustrating and I was left out much to be desired. That being said, now that I finished it, there, there is a, there is, the way I think of it is like there's just enough story in the game that now that I finished it and I've sat and digested it for a little bit, um, there's definitely a lot of things I can't wait to discuss on the spoiler cast. But there was also a lot of things where I'm sitting back now thinking like, man, that was really awesome. Like, uh, I'm I'm really glad that we got to see these certain things presented this way. Um. I with any Koji as with any Kojima game, I still have more questions than answers about a lot of different things. But um, you know, overall, I you know, I it's definitely borderline on a masterpiece as far as what a game is. You know, because it it Kojima knew exactly what he wanted this game to be. You know, from what I understand, you know, Peace Walker was a sample of what he had imagined 
Metal Gear Solid to be, and now the Phantom Pain was like a full realization of what that was, and you know, a lot of a lot of my frustration with it boiled down to just the fact that you know there are some really challenging missions in this game. Um, yeah, as compared to um, segments in past Metal Gear games where it's very linear and. You know, the biggest challenges that you have are, like, trying to figure out, you know, how to get around tricky boss fights, you know, like, with the different tricks that he set up and stuff like that. But, um, other than that, it's, it really is, um, you know, it, I, I also want to mention, too, that, you know, while we're saying that there's, the story is, you know, more sparse and not cutscene driven, there is hours and hours of cassette tapes to listen to that, you know, fill in that backstory. Mm -hmm, yeah. And so it requires a lot of focus and attention on your part to actually sit down and listen to those tapes, which can clear up a lot of that. Mm -hmm. So it, it's... And there's there's a lot of content that's... Uh, sorry, Dana. There's a lot of story that's hidden, or not hidden, but off the beaten path that you, you will definitely miss out if you don't catch it. Absolutely. I think the, the, the thing that's going to frustrate most people and frustrated me until I got over it was that this by no means is a typical Metal Gear Solid game. And I think that's obvious like in the first couple hours of playing the game that, that everyone's just gonna they're just gonna have to confront that. But, you know, once you kind of embrace the game for what it is, um you know, particularly the one thing I mentioned to Eric, you know, after I read his review is that I realized, you know, in a lot of ways, some of your best moments in this game you kinda of make for yourself, you know. You know, you might be given a mission where you're like, Okay, well there's not really a lot of story going on here but you create like these crazy experiences as you try to go because you know you're you're totally it's not linear you're totally left to go you know to go through the space any way that you want to and you create your own unique experiences whereas Eric could decide to go in guns blazing but I decided to go in completely stealth and there's you know a hundred troops around me and I'm just like, barely you know getting out by this you know but um but it's, if you go in guns blazing then you get a, a war score. Uh, you, well, get, you get a lower score, but the the real uh hurt it, hurt you feel, um in the game would be from not faultening maybe soldiers that were better, uh because they help uh, make your base better, um right, like, and they help develop new weapons. So like, I was behind. I know Zach was too. There was a mission that said you need missiles. Mm -hmm. and oh, that's where I'm at. Neither of us had rocket launchers. Me neither. Uh, I had probably killed the people that would make me rocket launchers, so I yes. could not make them. Made that mission a lot harder. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's that's exactly where I'm at now, and I have no idea what they're talking about. Like I, I brought grenades, and like that that wasn't working out. So I think that's the mission where I I think you have to destroy like three tanks. Yeah, I yeah I died a lot. Like that that mission got me really mad. I. <laughs> Couldn't get past it because I had a sniper rifle and I had uh, some grenades. So I think the only way that I actually got past it was I called in the helicopter to just shoot everyone. <laughs> uh, that's all I could do. I don't like doing that, just killing everyone to get the mission over with, but I had no choice. Normally what I like to do is I put everyone to sleep and send everyone to the mother base because I don't want to take any chances with killing anyone. I gotta give one big shout out too for the decision to include like all the greatest '80s hits. Having a lot of fun because it's oh, it's just it never gets old. Nope. <laughs> and sometimes you just play one, and it just kind of works perfectly with whatever you're doing at the moment. Yeah, uh, that's I've just wasted a lot of time just listening to that music and just kind of you know just driving away and just like getting my whores and just doing the stupidest things I can imagine while listening to, you know, take on me. And, uh, it, that, that, the, the 80 soundtrack, I think is what did it for, for me. Like, cause I haven't heard an 80 soundtrack that good since, uh, since Vice City. But well, the, the soundtrack was amazing. I, I didn't fully get involved into it until a little bit later. I'd played a couple of just to like, see what happened. Mm -hmm. But, it really made uh, invading bases a lot more fun, or chasing mm -hmm. anything down. Like, listen <laughs> to any '80s music it always makes something better. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was funny because I think it took me about halfway through the game where I realized that I could send set uh, music for my incoming choppers to play. What? I didn't yeah, know and I, so my <laughs> oh, that's what my the chopper. For. Oh, I 
I got yes. that, and I didn't even know it was. Yeah, I was just... So I would call in a chopper running from a base, people shooting at me, and my chopper comes in playing Billy Idol. Ah, and, <laughs> and it's just awesome. <laughs> yeah, the game. So, Eric97, you're, uh... You feel that's uh, the right score? It's like, it's three it, points away from being perfect. I don't think the game is perfect, because... Uh, it had a reputation to live up to, and it it kind of did its own thing, which which is why like it's not a hundred in my book, but because of just how good the game is, I gave it uh, the highest score I could, which was the ninety seven. I I'm just so like Zach said, I'm so thankful that I didn't have to review this game because I it wouldn't I, it still wouldn't be ready now. Like it's been three weeks, and I still wouldn't have been able to. Put it out, or like, or, or come up with a good score for that well, game. I'm glad I put in the time to beat it because there's a lot of content uh, post story that I would have missed out, and it would have definitely been a worse score if I hadn't got to that. Really? Yeah. I guess that's one game where it actually matters if you beat the game to find out what the proper well, score is. I thought it was done, and there was another 15 hours. So like, <laughs> there's there's a lot of post game content. See, to me, like, if I had to review this game now, where I'm at now, it, it's probably, like, a 7.5. Like, with all that I've seen now. Um, because it is missing a lot of the the Metal Gear cinematics and the story uh, that I'm used to. That kind of makes Metal Gear. Um, but, I mean, you guys are saying that'll change later on, so... I, yeah. I have to say... Probably, now that I think of it, I just want to mention my biggest disappointment with this game was the lack of crazy boss fights that are present in every Metal yeah. Gear Solid game. Yeah, we, uh... It, it's, it's hard. We talk about boss fights, and uh, I, I won't mention anything yes or no. Nah, no, nope, nope. There's, nope. there's just a... It's nope. a different game. Okay. Oh, okay. I thought you were gonna say you were, I thought you were gonna talk about a different game. But... I was gonna tell you who the bosses are. Nah, right. hey, 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 hey. <laughs> all right. Well, Metal Gear Solid Five, a good, good game, I guess. So we all agree it's a pretty good game. You guys should probably get it. I mean, it's a ninety-seven. It's not like anything special, but you'll find out more Wednesday, right, Eric? Yeah, I'm looking forward to hopefully Wednesday or early later this week. We will have our spoiler cast. Uh, we'll see if anyone else can finally catch up to us. Wednesday? That's uh, what? Two days. Oh, no, I'm not going to make that. I'm too busy. <laughs> like I committed myself to doing whatever I had to do to get through the story. I don't I don't want to do that. This is, I don't want to I don't want to <laughs> rush through it. Um, there's so much to do. Uh there's like there's too many <laughs> too many like trees to and plants to pick. <laughs> All right, so the black carrot. Oh, God. <laughs> I, see, I I love the game, but yeah, I mean, I, I shouldn't say anything because I'm still free. Like at the beginning, I'm not I'm not in any point where I should be making any judgments on it. But it, it's pretty repetitive. Uh, I I go into a mission and then I see a group of like four or five soldiers. I put everyone to sleep by shooting all five in the head. I parachute all of them to mother base, uh, and then I uh, and then I go do the same thing again. So I mean, I'm, I'm I'm sure that'll change. It's not like it's not fun when I do it. And, you know, it's but it's you once guys know what I mean. Once your uh, your gadgets and weapons start opening up, you'll start to be able to do more. Um, mm -hmm. For the first part of the game, the silence pistol and the silenced assault rifle are the best weapons to have, I think. Yeah, the the the, the the yeah the silence pistol is all I use. That's all yeah. I like to use. I don't when, even want to kill anyone. Once you hit a certain point and the items start uh, developing, that's when it gets really interesting. See, I want a sniper rifle that can put people to sleep, and I wanna. And you guys are really quiet, so I'm, I'm assuming something like that happens later on. But uh, well, we don't want to say too much yeah. more because it'll anything really, you know. It'll spoil the experience, yeah. and for those who want spoiled, mm -hmm. you'll get more of that I later. really love robots. I hope I get to see some later on, but <laughs> that's Metal Gear Solid Five. Zach, uh, you wanted to talk about a feature that you wrote uh, last week on Destiny. Yeah, so I just wanted to say a little bit. Um, 
I wrote a feature on a little game, you know, you might have heard of called Destiny. Never heard. By uh, Bungie. Um, it, oh, it's just relevant, because as the time we're recording this, The Taken King literally has just launched, which is the new expansion for the game. It's not even really an expansion, it's like a total overhaul of the original game that was released. And, you know, I, it, it's relevant, you know, just because, not because it's being released, but, you know, I had a lot to say about the game in my feature, um, about how disappointed I was with the original launch, and how about, I think a great many people who bought the game felt that way. You know, when the game came out, you know, it was, it, Bungie already had a reputation with games like Halo, which has a rabid fan base. You know, those are great games. And they, they, they came out with this new game called Destiny, which was supposed to be, you know, something akin to Halo, but having like a massive sci-fi epic story behind it. And what we got was a game with literally no story whatsoever and just the most repetitive gameplay loot grind that I've ever experienced in a game. Um, that being said, it was... You know, it was addictive fun for a while because, you know, if, you, if you're the kind of person who gets sucked into those kind of loot grinds, you know, you can find yourself having fun with it. But it just gets, it just got to the point very quickly where you realize that there was just no substance to this game whatsoever. And considering the massive budget that Bungie, Bungie had behind that game, um, you know, there was really no excuse for it. Um, and when I heard that this was coming out, I was one of the biggest opponents of it. Um, you know, why do, why would I want to give them more money to fix a game that should have been the way it was already to begin with? But that being said, I, in the past few weeks, I've gotten back into it and they've actually already changed quite a bit in the game since then to add more content. And, um, this expansion is going to totally overhaul the game and supposedly fix every issue that I list in the game, such as the lack of story, the lack of, uh, versatility and type of content that you can do, um, all the kinds of things like that. So, I I look forward to playing through the expansion quite a bit, and I look forward to uh, giving my thoughts on whether or not Bungie has lived up to it. Because as far as I'm concerned, if they don't live up to what they what they said that were they were going to do after already failing once, um, I think it's going to really really hurt their reputation like permanently because. I can't. I can't overstate how poor the game was when it was originally launched. Wow. Yeah. Was it that so, bad? Well, what have they changed? Because like I, I was in in the beginning, and I got to level twenty, and I got to maybe twenty two or twenty three, and I was like, I can't do this anymore. Right. So you know, for Paul, you never played it at no. all. So basically, you you have a care. It's it's an it's like an MMO shooter. Um, not a full MMO. You're you're limited to how many other players are in a particular zone. That's kind of instance, and um, you you have your main story quests, which ironically have no story. So I mean, you're kind of doing these tasks that have no context behind them whatsoever. Um, and the worst part of it is, is that these tasks are usually repetitive. It's usually like get to this objective move to this objective, and now fight off a horde, and then the mission ends. And that's pretty much every mission. Um, there was really no end game content or anything like that. And the only other thing you had left to do was like these daily tasks that most MMO haves have, uh, to, to do every day. And it was just extremely repetitive and there was no substance to it. And the only reason you would keep doing it was because you had like a 1% chance to get like a legendary special gun to drop. And that was pretty much the whole grind, um, which can be really addicting for a lot of people, especially if you've played MMOs like I have. But with the Taken King, they have decided to add more of those important character and story moments that are missing to make your character seem like it's not just like a lifeless avatar, but actually has a role in the universe. Um, since then, they've added several raids um, to the game, which you can play with a fire team that have a decent amount of story and add some versatility other than just grinding out the same missions over and over again. Um, they've overhauled all of the guns and made the loot more reliable because there were times where you could get like 
an item that could that was supposed to be decoded into a rare weapon, but would turn out to just be common junk because the, the the loot system was just broken. Mm-hmm. So it was just it was so frustrating and unrewarding. Um, but it was random. They've wasn't added. It? Yeah, well, you so you have these things called engrams, which you can decode into guns, and typically, so if it's a green engram, that means that it's like, uh, you know, a decent weapon, but it's not great, and it would decode into an item of that level. If you got a legendary engram, you would hope that it would translate into a legendary gun, but those legendary engrams would often turn into something that just sucked, and it would be like, okay, I just grinded my ass off for you know, this item that turned into nothing. And it was just, you know, a very frustrating, unrewarding system for players who would literally spend hours and hours and hours trying to get the best gear. Um, but, you know, they've, the most important part of, I think, this whole change is the fact that they've added a whole bunch of quests, a whole bunch of story quests to give meaning behind the things that you're doing now. And it's not just literally mindless, repetitive tasks because that's all that it boiled down to do this mindless task, kill a hundred enemies, do a hundred, do five of these uh, patrol missions, do this just to get your reputation up so that you might get a gun. And that was pretty much the whole game. And there was really no other meaning behind anything else that you were doing, which is why it was so poor considering that I think fans were expecting, like I know I was expecting something along the lines of like, Mass Effect, which has like this epic, massive, you know, sci-fi lore, you know, involved in space like that. And then for it to just be the complete opposite was just such a letdown. Yeah, I was I was really looking forward to the the story because like MMOs were never really my thing. And just the trailers all looked really cool. It had this cool universe and the initial build of the game was just not fun especially by myself like if i had someone playing with me it was a little better right but i could not do it on my own yeah i did it i, only, I mean i i yeah. go ahead i'm sorry i, I only played on my own just mm-hmm. so i could keep up with the person who was playing with normally mm, right i i still think it'll remain that you know you it's a, it's a game better played with friends and i understand that you know but um I, I, it sounds like they're adding a lot of story content that can make it fun for those moments when your friends aren't online. So, And that's really pertinent to me because, I mean, I finally did get to take part in those raids with random people I met online. Uh, hopefully, it sounds like a lot of people I know are going to be buying it so that I can do things more like that. But, um, you know, they they really have a lot of room to improve to make it more appetizing to players like you, like yourself who, you know, don't necessarily have a lot of people to play with. So should I get the game? Because I was thinking about getting it. You know that side. Well, I have, I I have the game. Taken King has actually already installed on the console. It's just waiting for it to unlock. Mm-hmm. So I mean, if they live up to what they said they changed, I think that this game is going to be exponentially better. And you know, I'm always encouraging people to get it because. Like I said, I think a lot of the fun is to be had whenever you have friends to do group content with. So I can't give my honest opinion until I actually play it to see if, you know, you know, Bungie could also just be saying that the things are better now because I mean, but you know, you've been burned once, so it's hard to say, but I was willing to take the plunge just based off of what they are promising to be changed because I, I, I surely hope that they wouldn't do the same thing twice. So, do you think this is something we'll be able able to get a review from you when it comes out? Yeah, uh, hopefully I'm looking forward to it. I mean, there's supposedly going to be an incredible amount of content. So, I mean, whether how how soon I'll be able to explore all that content, you know, that's kind of the nature of MMOs is that, you know, they're not meant to be beaten, you know, as I was able to just grind through the Phantom Pain. So, I mean... I definitely look forward to writing about, you know, a counter post to my current feature about what I think. But, uh, you know, I got to I got to got to get my hands wet with the material before I can say any more about it. All right, cool. Uh, all right. That's all uh, from the Destiny uh, feature that you wanted to talk about. Um, I think the only thing that's left that we uh, want to want to talk about a little bit is since. Eric, you are doing the weekly bites every week. Mm-hmm. Every week. Uh, it's a, I mean, I guess I should explain. People 
if if you're not aware, we had a whole uh, Metal Gear Solid week last week. We had the review, we had uh, the top ten, and we had uh, like a whole bunch of features. Uh, one of our writers reviewed um, the original Metal Gear, which is really really cool to have on the same week as uh, Metal Gear Solid Five. And uh, the weekly bites are basically the questions of the week. You know, something that we uh, we make to uh, engage our readers on. And last week, I'm sorry, the week before last, uh, during Metal Gear Solid Week, we had one that said, uh, that one was, what's your favorite stealth game? And there is a picture of Solid Snake on there. So it's, it's, it's I was actually expecting uh, everyone to say, uh, only Metal Gear Solid, but people who did respond, there were some different, uh, some different games. I was actually surprised about that. Uh, Luis, Luis, who is our uh, uh, event coordinator, he said Thief Two. Uh, I've never played Thief Two, but that's all he wrote. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys have played Thief Two at all, but apparently it's it's okay. I I, I played uh, the most recent Thief, which I did not like at all. Mm. So I don't know if that's an indicator. <laughs> I never played the older ones. I know they have a huge reputation for being some of the best uh, stealth PC uh, stealth games that were out at the time, at least. Nah, I'll have to check it out. But I've I've never played a single Thief game, but it seems like a stealth game. Uh, Logan May. I-, I love Logan May. By the way, can I say that because he is like he is my favorite. Uh, commenter on our uh, Facebook post. He's like, as soon as we post something, he's right there, like ready to respond to a question. Uh, Logan May, if you're listening, I love you. Uh, he said, Absolutely. he said, I'm not really sure what I'd consider my favorite stealth game since I haven't really played a whole lot of games that are technically part of the stealth genre. I like stealth game. Uh, I like the stealth elements of games like The Elder Scrolls. All oh, right, I guess you had the. Uh, Kind of like the the sneaking missions in that game. Uh, yeah, you could and you could crouch and you could you could play bow and like dagger, I think, and uh, try and get kills before they actually see you. It, I never was very good at the stealth in those games, though. Yeah, I mean, the only stealth part of those games I liked was the pickpocketing, because it was just I would just get free stuff. Uh, and then he says, "I like the stealth elements of you know that game, uh, but aside from maybe Assassin's Creed." Uh, which seems to be getting farther and farther from the genre anymore. That's true. Uh, I don't know what I could even say that I've played that are actually part of the genre. Well, I mean, I guess uh, that part of the Elder Scrolls counts. I mean, that's kind of like... That is... I, from what I've seen of Thief, that's kind of how Thief works. You just... You can go into a mission, you know, killing everyone, but that's not really the point, and you're not really gonna... You're not gonna get the most out of the game. Uh, Saniac, who is our, uh, one of our, uh, video guys, he makes a lot of cool reviews. He's from the UK, so check out his videos. Uh, Psy Reviews, that they're called. He says, I don't know about favorites, uh, but Splinter Cell Pandora Tomorrow is underrated. I haven't played that in forever. I've only played the first Splinter Cell. I don't know if you guys have played any of them, but the first one was, it was okay. It was supposed to be the Metal Gear Solid, um, kind of, uh, equivalent on the xbox i uh didn't play one until um the one on 360 double agent that was the first one and this is the only one i ever played for that series i don't know i don't I have no idea what's going on with that series anymore because i from what i remember uh what was his name sam something sam fisher sam fisher he was already pretty old in the first game you know he had like the gray spots on the side of his hair he was out of retirement to do a final mission uh but then five games later he it's like he looks like he's getting younger and younger as the series go on Uh, i haven't played them but the last one that i've seen that came out he looks like he looks 20 years younger and i'm not sure what's happening with sam fisher i think there is some uh some like Metal Gear weird stuff happening in that series, as far as I know. <laughs> so, Zach, what uh, what's your favorite Soul game? Well, since nobody else is going to be the guy, I'm going to say it's Metal Gear Solid oh One. Oh my god, Zach! <laughs> that 
I have, but an honorable mention goes to a game that's not frequently talked about, and that's Metal Gear Solid VR Missions. Oh, yeah, I have that game. I I don't know why I did it, but I played that game until I beat everything that was in it. Actually, I remember why I did it because I think if you beat everything, you got like special screenshots that were like the previewing Sons of Liberty at that oh. time. Oh, I thought it was. I thought you were talking about like the screenshots of like that there were clips of sexy schoolgirls in the, in there somewhere. Because <laughs> I know that was in one of those games. No, I I think there were like shots of like Metal Gear Ray or something like that. Something very vague. Really? It was like not at all satisfying for how much uh, strife I went through to complete that game one hundred percent. That but... was in the game in ninety nine when that came out. Yeah, I think I believe I believe that was the whole reason why it was actually me and my cousin. We took turns, you know, because there were some missions that were just like, "How in the hell am I supposed to beat this?" Mm-hmm. You know, but I mean, it was a cool game. I mean, it was just like training for the real thing when you play the actual game. I like to think I was a lot better at the games back then because I played the Phantom Pain, and I am not so good at Metal Gear games anymore. Eric, what's your favorite stealth game? <laughs> um, stealth, I. I know I was always a fan of the Assassin's Creed series. Uh, I think the last one that had good stealth in it would have been 2 or Brotherhood. I always liked Brotherhood because I like calling in my assassins to do the work, so I felt like that's kind of stealthy. But uh, other than that, I mean, I'm looking through my games right now. Uh, I don't know, I... I like stealth elements in a lot of the games. Like, Last of Us had some good stealth elements in it. Um, oh, yeah, it did. I'm trying to avoid Metal Gear because we've talked a lot about it. Yeah, so, even um, though there's a picture of Solid Snake in uh, Let's see. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not a huge stealth fan. Of De- Deus Ex had some good stealth elements. I know Dishonored is supposed to be really good. I haven't played that one yet. Um, but... I mean, Metal Gear series was always number one for me, and then a lot of games had some good ideas that I liked, like The Last of Us, and uh, even Uncharted had some good brief moments, and I think 3 had some good stealth. Um, my... I just thought of this right now, because I, I was just going to say Metal Gear Solid, uh, but uh, my favorite uh, stealth... It's actually not a stealth game, it's a stealth portion in the game, and that was in Ocarina of Time, when you have to sneak into the uh, castle to talk to um, Princess Zelda. I don't know if you guys remember that. Uh, you have to get past the guards. Uh, if you're like in the courtyard, and you have to sneak around them, and then if you get caught, then you have to start over from the beginning. Have you guys not played Ocarina of Time? You've played Ocarina of Time. So I'm going to... Just get this out in the air right oh now. My God, I me. am not a Zelda fan. Oh my God. <laughs> I thought you were going to say that you haven't played Ocarina enough time. I have. I played like the first hour of Ocarina oh of Time. That's God. about it. <laughs> Someone I've actually played more of than than me. Yeah, Eric doesn't play games. To, like he doesn't complete games. So I think he's actually played more Ocarina enough time than you, Zach. Which is yeah. pretty pretty impressive. I actually know what Paul's talking about in this, which is kind of bad. Yes. Oh, Zach. Have you really never... You haven't finished Ocarina of Time? No, the only Zelda game I finished was uh, Wind Waker. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. But That's the only one I played. And I just to say that I played one and I honestly tried it and I just decided it wasn't Have you me. Have you not played uh, Link to the Past? No. Hey. Really? I'm serious. How... I, I don't have a lot of experience with Nintendo. I mean, I've always been a PlayStation Oh, I keep forgetting guy, about that. Just, yeah, you're not really a, much yeah. of a Nintendo guy, but still, you have to... I mean, it's not, not, nothing against Nintendo. It's just what I grew up my, with. My, uh... Okay, as your boss, my assignment to you is to play Ocarina of Time. <laughs> uh, complete it. I'll override that. You don't need it. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but yeah, you should probably play one of the greatest games of all time. It's not, if not the best game of all time. Yeah, oh, I guess. I, yeah. I, I have it on my list too. It's I have two save files on the GameCube version and the N64 I'm trying to work through. Well, that was the, our uh, talk about the best stealth games. 
uh, somehow turned into us talking about uh, how Zach has never played or finished like hard enough time. He's never played a link to the past. That's why I never want to remember that. Oh my god, Zach. <laughs> uh, that's about it. it. We've this has been about an hour and a half. I wanted this to be a short cast, but it never works out that way. But it was pretty fun. If you guys have never been to our site, bitcultures uh, dot com, please check it out. There's a lot of cool writers doing a lot of cool stuff. Uh, real quick before we go, what do you guys want to plug? What do you, Zach? What are you writing uh, for next week? Uh, next week I have a lot of stuff. I uh. We just received a copy of a game called Cross of the Dutchman, mm. which I played through and turned over today. In, in like 10 minutes. <laughs> so I gave you the game, you played it. No, I gave you the game at lunch, right? And then I came back from lunch at work and you're like, and you said, hey, uh, I played it, I, I wrote the review, it's done. How does that happen? That is not true. <laughs> it was like 6.30. It was like two hours. <laughs> The game was about two hours long, and I it took about an hour, hour and a half to. Write I don't know how you do that. Review on it. All right. Uh, I mean, it was it was a it was a very simple game. Let's put it that way. And I also uh, recently just reviewed uh, Mega Man Legacy, which is up today, mm-hmm. and uh, Evil Within, mm-hmm. which was a very enjoyable survival horror. I game. Need, I need to play that. That's from the. the uh... I think that's from Mikami, right? The Mikami. Yeah, right? yeah. And then uh, I forget his name, but it's the uh, composer from the Silent Hill games did the music for that. Mm. So that's I, I love those series. So that's a game I should have played a long time ago. Yes, Eric. What uh, are you working on? Anything? Uh, I'm gonna be working on the spoiler cast later this week with Zach and uh, a guest we have. Not me. And uh, not you, because you'll never finish. <laughs> no, I'm uh, not I. Uh, <laughs> have a game coming in the mail, uh, Sweet It In 2, maybe if I can get myself to write either something about that in the future oh, after write, playing it. You should write a classic uh, review of that, you know? I actually really am excited to play it. I have delved into all the hype for that game the past six months, and uh, I just bit the bullet and bought a really nice copy online, hopefully, and uh, we'll see what I think of it. When you After you finish, can I borrow the game and play it myself? I'll take no. good care of it. No. <laughs> no, I know it's an expensive game, but I will, I will make sure nothing happens to it. I promise, Eric. <laughs> like I promise, my cat will not somehow. I'd rather get to just it. give you the five dollars to download it online. I no, I'm not I'm doing. I was gonna say, get it on your Vita uh, for five bucks. I, I, I need Eric's <laughs> copy. <laughs> All right, well, that's about it for us here at the Bitcast. Uh, check out bitcultures.com, and until then. See ya. Guys, say bye. Bye. See you later. What a thrill With darkness and silence through the night What a thrill I'm searching and I'll melt into you But you're so supreme I give my life Not for honor But for you In my time There'll be no one else Cry On a tree frog, it's so dear the trial to survive for the day.
唱。